Welcome to a special edition of Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Jason Kelly here in New York. Well, we're celebrating the 50 people from finance to fashion, technology to trade, who defined 2019. In the next hour, we'll hear from some of them, including Ethan Brown. He's the founder and CEO of Beyond Meat. It was one of the best performing IPOs of the year. Joey Levin, he's grown the value of IAC and Match Group into a digital juggernaut worth $10.5 billion. And Stephanie Kelton, She's the economist behind modern monetary theory. We call it MMT. She took it mainstream, the once fringe theory you now hear about on the campaign trail. But first, here's editor Joel Weber. My co-host Carol Master and I sat down with him at the third annual Bloomberg 50 celebration here in New York at the Morgan Library and Museum. As we reach out throughout the newsroom to all of the 2,700 journalists and analysts within Bloomberg, to make sure that we can have a list that actually really represents sort of the zeitgeist of the year. What's really cool too is you guys start early in the year, right? From what I understand, like back in the spring. Yeah, well, I mean, and we try and count for the whole year. So it, yeah. it, it's really a chance to recognize even things that happen in January and February, we're kind of taking into account. And so when you sort of set this in motion in a year like this, how do you pick out the themes? I mean, how do you sort of break it down? So you, it's a, it's a, evolving process yeah. um, and it goes up until the last minute, right? But things start to stand out over the course of the year, whether it's a deal that, um, especially in the oil M&A was one that really jumped out at us this year, like yeah. that, that, that kind of distinguishes stuff. And then you kind of like give it a little time and you come back to it and say, did that thing hold up or was it an anomaly? Right. Or did something else happen that got bigger than that, right? Or was it just like, you know, we, we, have, a, we have a lot of people on the list. We also have a chicken sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> and it broke, you know, this is a Popeye's chicken sandwich that broke the internet is yeah. what, what, what we realized. They had a three-month supply run out in a matter of days. It's crazy. And, you know, like something like that, it's just like, you, uh, even if you're like business executive who dreams this up, you have no idea that it's going to like take off quite like that, right. right? And so we build into the process that there's opportunities to just embrace things that are slightly outside of our, our usual place. And I love folks like Kylie Jenner, right, who yeah. are on the list for a couple of things that they did. Co a couple things, and, you know, that's it's uh, it's a big money, the self-made billionaire, Gen yeah. Z's first billionaire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's an amazing accomplishment, and that's why we do this. Well, from Popeye's fried chicken to fake burgers, or maybe we should say real burgers with fake meat. A big name on the Bloomberg 50 list, Ethan Brown. He's the founder and CEO of Beyond Meat. That company went public back in May and ranks among the top 10 best performing IPOs in the U.S., for the year, we spoke with him from LA on what surprised him most and what's coming up next. It always is around continuing to educate not only the consumer but the media around just how healthy and uh, how much our company is driven by the human health imperative. If you look at the products we're creating, take the Dunkin' uh, sausage, for example. That product has 50% less fat, it has 44% less saturated fat, it's 37% less sodium, and it has more protein and more iron. So when you're beginning with a blank canvas and you're able to build a piece of meat directly from plants, you can leave out a lot of the things that you wouldn't want to be consuming on a daily basis, such as cholesterol, and you can lower things like saturated fat, and you can provide the consumer with a very healthy product that they get to enjoy, yet continue to move the ball forward year over year and making the products healthier and healthier. So as we get into 2020, you'll see us continue to drive toward goals that will enable the consumer to eat what they love, but do it in a way that's healthier for them. Walk us through the process of assessing these partnerships. You know, you name checked some of the best known when it comes to, you know, fast food. You've also got some partnerships in casual dining. How does that work? Because pun intended, it feels like everybody wants a piece of this market right now. Right, so you always want to align yourself with the marquee players, and, and that's what we've done from the beginning of the company. So when we decided to go into retail way back in, in 2009, the first company we called was Whole Foods, and then we've been able to proliferate out through Kroger, et cetera. But when you then you look at our venture history, the, the first venture firm we worked with was Kleiner Perkins, and now we have a great list, including Great Point Ventures and many others. Um, but if, if you're now uh, looking at the fast food space or the quick serve restaurant space, you also want to adopt the same philosophy. Who are the marquee players and how do you become uh, of service to them? And that's what we've been able to do, whether it's McDonald's, uh, whether it's Subway, uh, whether it's KFC or Dunkin'. We're constantly looking, Carl's Jr., Hardee's, et cetera. We're constantly looking to serve the very best partners uh, in the space so that we can grow with them. 
What's the focus? Is it retail or food service, or will it be a 50-50 split going forward? Our focus is entirely on the consumer. It's our relationship with the consumer that makes the, the business so special. We listened to what they say. They told us no GMOs. They told us nothing artificial. They said keep everything natural, so that's what we do. Um, and that makes it harder, by the way. We, it would be much easier to genetically modify plant material to make it uh, uh, take on the, the texture and appearance and aroma of, of, of animal protein. Right. But we won't do that. And so we're constantly uh, focused on what the consumer wants. We'll meet the consumer where they are. So if it's, if it's, uh, it's quick serve restaurants, we'll be there for them. If it's retail, will be for them. So, right now, it's about 50-50, and yeah. the market will tell us which direction they're okay, going. Okay, so it could change going forward. Yeah. All right. And sure. so, Ethan, when you think about the test, let's just talk about McDonald's for a second. What have you learned so far? Because obviously, that's from a volume perspective, but also from a brand perspective, something that everyone, investors included, have been looking at very closely. What have you taken away from that test? So I had the great privilege of being up in the uh, Ontario area uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I drove out to uh, McDonald's there, and um, I went to three different stores and had the burger at each, uh, at each location, and they were identical and delicious. It was a fantastic experience for me, and one that was um, very satisfying. It's a goal I've had for a very long time to be of service to McDonald's. Um, it's going very well. I think you heard the CEO of, of McDonald's Canada say that. Uh, we can't comment further than what they've said publicly, but I'm very enthusiastic about that relationship and our ability to grow the partnership. Does it expand then to the United States? That's up to them. Um, but what you want is a great test, and, and I think we have every sign that that's the case. China accounts for about 27% of the world's meat consumption by volume. Um, they already eat a lot of plant proteins, and they kind of look at meat as a, a bit of a status symbol there. What's your approach? What's your expectations for China? Uh, you'll see us um, be very aggressive there. We are aggressive in each market that we yeah. occupy, whether here in the United States, mentioning again those partners with McDonald's, KFC, Dunkin', Subway, et cetera. Um, uh, you'll see us uh, move with speed um, and exploit the, the first mover advantage we have globally in terms of building the brand that's most closely associated with the plant-based meat movement. Um, so I can't disclose anything particular, but you can guess that uh, we're very excited about that market um, and, and very active in, in our plans. All right, let's talk a little bit about chicken, if we can. Uh, big chicken fans here as well. I'm kind of hungry, uh, I'm just going to tell uh, you. Seriously. I mean, the, the KFC test, as it were, uh, down in Atlanta, I believe, is where that was. Yeah. It went gangbusters. How soon can you sort of get into that market in a meaningful way? So you'll see some exciting things from us uh, in the poultry space in, in 2020. I can't name specific partners or, or developments, but... Um, you know, we look at three core platforms with beef, uh, pork, and poultry. And you can see consumers pulling off very quickly of beef and, and pork. Uh, and you're also starting to see some uh, uh, pressure around uh, the poultry industry. So um, we, we've done a lot of work there. You'll see uh, the fruits of that in, in 2020. I do wonder what you've learned along this very interesting year as a CEO and as a leader uh, of a company that really is about a lifestyle and sort of who we are. So to get up every day and be able to go into an office and, and work on issues that are so important, not only to me personally, but to the world, uh, is a privilege. And so uh, this year, I think we were recognized by the markets uh, for mm -hmm. what we're doing. Um, you know, and we don't believe uh, that this is a, a short-lived uh, trend. Uh, this is something that has very long legs to it. Um, if you think about what we're doing, we're not suggesting that people don't eat meat. We think that'd be a big mistake. You know, I grew up eating meat, I love meat, I love fried chicken, I love burgers. The idea behind the company is to provide a better form of meat, right? To provide meat that uh, provides all of the delicious, satiating experience that we've come to love, uh, but does so uh, in a way that's healthy for your bodies and, and healthier for the earth. Um, you know, if you look at what the mobile phone did in relation to the landline, nobody had to denigrate the landline. And we don't think we have to denigrate animal protein. We simply have to provide the consumer with a new and, and better choice and let them make the decision. And if we're successful, uh, right. more and more will sign on with us. Coming up, more from the Bloomberg 50, an economist who took modern monetary theory mainstream and cannabis going green in the US, worth a lot of money. This is Bloomberg Business Week.
to Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Jason Kelly. Join me and my partner, Carol Master for Bloomberg Business Week every day on the radio, starting at 2 p.m. Wall Street time. Also, catch up on our daily show by checking out our podcast. You can get that at Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Bloomberg.com, wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us online at businessweek.com and through our mobile app. Well, back to our annual Bloomberg 50 list. In 2019, a once fringe school of economic thought had a big moment. We're talking about modern monetary theory. It's known as MMT, and it argues that the government can essentially just print money to pay for what it needs. It's even turning up a lot on the 2020 presidential campaign trail. That's largely because of one economist, Stephanie Kelton. Here's our conversation from the B-50 celebration in New York City. It is kind of astonishing, right, that I think in a lot of ways what's happening is that people are coming to some sort of terms with the idea that when the next downturn comes, um, policymakers aren't going to be able to reach for the usual toolkit right. and do what they've done in the past, that we're going to have to start thinking maybe more creatively, more ambitiously about what policymakers can do in response to a, a growing weakness in the economy. And I think... Um, um, for many people, MMT is just increasingly viewed as that alternative that can help us to, um, you know, think about ways to to be more ambitious when so we don't have to suffer that. the right. kind of long, protracted recession that we had right. last time. Right. And so, Stephanie, were you surprised that this was a year where a lot of people from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to Bernie Sanders, who Carol mentioned, you know, they introduced it. We talk about the Overton window all the time, yeah. right? You know, that this sort of moved in MMT's favor I love in when you many say ways. Overton window. It I makes know. me so proud. Right. It makes me I so, love the idea of moving so windows, right. doors, yeah, exactly, doors right. flying exactly. off hinges. Um, but it was a moment, you know, yeah. and obviously yeah. it entered into the political and, and I dare say even at least the mainstream business zeitgeist, to quote our colleague yeah. Tom Keene. Were you surprised? I mean, yes and no. You know, I mean, it, it, you've been pushing hard to get that breakthrough moment for a set of ideas, and right. you've really worked as a scholar and as an academic and with a number of other people as well. I mean, this is a team effort, and, you know, we put uh, heart and soul into this project for more than two decades now. And so at some point, you do expect it to pay right. off, <laughs> I, I guess, you know. Um, but then when you have that moment and you have politicians of the type that you're talking about, about giving some oxygen to these ideas. It really is remarkable. Tell us, though, because for everyone like a Bernie Sanders and some other individuals, high profile, who are supporting MMT, you know you've had a lot of high profile names. I know Paul Krugman, you've had a little bit of a battle, you know, certainly a war of words. Um, I'm curious if you're having more and more conversations with more folks that maybe were against it that are starting to say, hey, you've got an idea here. Yeah, I mean, so for me, some of the most fun conversations and communications I have are those that aren't public. It's the people who reach out to me privately and, you know, were it known who these people are, I think the shock waves would reverberate <laughs> in, in a much more dramatic fashion. But it's just encouraging to know that there are people who are really out there willing to take the scholarship seriously, right. ask questions questions when they're not sure, um, you know, do the ideas justice and not sort of caricature them and, and create a, an, an atmosphere of fear and concern where these are really just, I think, very sensible and sound economic principles. So here's what we call a hard turn from monetary theory to cannabis. Another hot topic for the U.S. in 2019 and another name you should know, that's Boris Jordan. He turned Cureleaf into the biggest U.S. cannabis company with a market value of about $2.5 billion. Here's what he had to say about making the list. It sort of reflects the fact that people are starting to accept the fact that cannabis is going to be a part of our lives in the United States. We have 33 states that, are, that, that have legalized cannabis in one form or another. Uh, more and more people are using it. And the fact that Bloomberg has recognized that, I think, is a big deal. And it shows that it's becoming mainstream. Well, Boris, and I do think about, you know, for a while we just talked about the Canadian cannabis companies, and I do feel like 2019 was a lot more about the U.S. companies and yours included. Um, what do you think 2020 is going to be when it comes to the cannabis story? We, we are waiting for, you know, regulations to come out from the government, you know, so I'm just curious what you think will be coming well, in 2020. Well, if we can get over it, impeachment, yeah. um, <laughs> which I hope we will at some point in time, I, I, th I think it's going to be a continuation of the U.S. story. And that's not to say anything negative about Canada, but it's just a bigger market. 
the U.S. companies are all turning profitable. Um, you're starting to see more and more of them. I think the numbers that are going to be put up by U.S. companies next year are going to be quite big and staggering. And I think that will get recognized not only uh, you know, by Washington, but I think also by the markets at large. And right. I think you know, large, the mainstream investors have largely avoided right. uh, cannabis until this to, to today. And I think you're going to start seeing a lot more of them get involved as they see these companies start to put up significant numbers. Well, and talk to us about sort of the big companies getting involved, because there have been some twists and turns, shall we say, with some of the bigger U.S. companies sort of dipping their toe in, some making some investments. I'm thinking of Constellation, obviously. Uh, how does the sort of consumer packaged goods market get more involved in this? How important is it that they get involved in order to grow this business in a meaningful way? Curaleaf announced that we we hired um, uh, Joe Byron, who ran uh, uh, Dr. Pepler uh, Snapple. He built uh, Voss Water. Before that, he was uh, at uh, um, uh, Seagram's company. So He's a real guy. These are guys that are built and run very big CPG businesses that understand brands and understand supply chain. And you're starting to see more and more of those people enter this market. And I think that's the first sign. Um, and the reason they're coming before the big companies is because we're still federally legal. Yeah. But I think you're going to get two pieces of legislation in 2020. I think you're going to get the Safe Banking Act, and I think you will get the States Act. Once you get the States Act is when you're going to start seeing some of the big multinationals really starting to take a hard look at cannabis. Because it just fits so well with every one of their other products that they sell today. Whether it be you know beverages or food or, or add, uh, different additives. And the pharma companies are going to be the last because they're really waiting for synthetic cannabis. Mm. Once you get synthetic cannabis, you'll start to see the pharma companies get involved as well. Coming up, more from the Bloomberg 50. We hear from the duo behind the biggest deal in the podcast industry. You've heard their work. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Welcome back to Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Jason Kelly. You can also listen to Bloomberg Business Week on the radio on Sirius XM Channel 119, also AM 1130 in New York, 1061 in Boston, 991 FM in Washington, D.C., AM 960 in the Bay Area, and London on DAB Digital and through the Bloomberg Business app. Well, back to our special coverage of the Bloomberg 50. In February, Alex Bloomberg and Matt Lieber sold their podcasting company called Gimlet to Spotify for $230 million. It was the biggest deal yet in that nascent industry. Unlike music, podcasting is a way for Spotify to attract new subscribers without paying royalties to the recording industry. We sat down with them at the Bloomberg 50 celebration in New York. We started the company in 2014, uh, and, and uh, we were both sort of coming at it from separate uh, perspectives. I was, uh, I was working in podcasting already. I worked at This American Life, and I had uh, started uh, Planet Money with my co-founder, Ad, uh, Adam Davidson. Right. And so I was seeing sort of like this excitement building around this new on-demand way that like audio was getting delivered to people, and I just saw the excitement building, and I was like, we just, somebody should make, more of these, and then Matt had a, was like in the, on the other side of the sort of like uh, of the of the of the scene, looking and seeing the same sort of thing. Is he that was, true, uh, Matt? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think our insight was that if you look over the whole history of media, every time a new medium comes about, new a new media company gets built. Yeah. And so. A hundred years ago, the new medium was radio, and that's when CBS got built, and that's when NBC got built. And we felt on-demand digital audio podcasts were a new medium, and we wanted to build the defining brand for this new medium, and that was Gimlet. But isn't it fascinating because it is like radio in terms of you know just listening to a great story being told, and I just think the simple part, it's just such a simple thing, but it's great, but it harkens back to radio, well, right? It or harkens even further back than that. I mean, I think what, if you think about like what we're doing in podcasts, a lot of times what we're doing is the, is is one of the oldest forms of media in human existence is telling stories to yeah. one another. Right, right. And we've been telling stories to one another before there was any other media available. We, like many of the oldest stories in in human history were oral stories before they were ever written down. They were they were telling them before human language was even, written language was invented. And so it's very deep and very primal. And uh, and I think that was one of the issues when we were sort of like first starting this company, everyone was like, but it's just talking, right? And we we're yeah. like, no, no, no. But it's also on the backs of this new of, of new technology and, and all these new tools that we bring to it. 
And so where are we sort of in, in the evolution here? Because you guys, as we said, we're early. A lot of people have sort of piled in. It feels like, I mean, we have a podcast. Everybody has a, <laughs> like, you know, everybody standing around us probably uh, has a podcast. Like, where, where does it go next, Matt? We think we're just at the very beginning. And the, the, the term that um, I think you, you, you've been using is that we're at the dawn of the second golden age of audio. The first golden yeah. age of audio was in the 1930s and 1940s. It was when broadcast news was born. It was when you saw fiction like The Shadow with Orson Welles come right. about. And now, and you know, audio hasn't evolved that much in the last 60, 70 years until now. And now what you have are a couple of big technology changes. So you have smartphones in every pocket. You have connected cars coming online. A lot of listening happens in the cars. And you've got smart home devices that people are listening at home and even talking to their dashboard when they're in their car. And so all these things have combined for this whole new um, listening kinds of listening experiences to come out and new sorts of storytelling. So there's a whole generation of creators being born now to work for this medium. It's a more intimate, it's like radio, but it's yeah. more intimate. Right. Um, there is something about putting on your headphones or something yeah. and just kind of going yeah, into your world. Yeah, when you listen to a podcast, it feels like you're listening to your best friend hang out with you or tell you a story that's just made for you. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the business side of all of this because storytelling's great. We all love telling stories. <laughs> we like listening to them. We like telling them. We certainly like uh, hearing ourselves talk because we do it for hours a day, every day. But you guys figured out a way to make a real business uh, out of this, something that Spotify was able to and willing to pay you a lot of money for. Clearly, they see a business here how does distribution ultimately work in a profitable way? Matt? Um, yeah, that's a good that's a good question. We um, we did build a business here, and so Sp uh, Gimlet is um, it was mainly an advertising business. It turns out podcasting, this intimacy that happens in audio, makes it great for storytelling. It also makes it great for advertising, and we're reaching a very unique consumer. They tend to be younger, more affluent, more educated, and they're very hard to reach. Our name for them is the Unreachables. And we're getting them with this very um, direct, personal kind of ad product that really worked for us. And so, so we built a business around that. Um, and then about a year ago, we, we started having more serious conversations with Spotify. And in Spotify, we saw a really a global, giant um, music company that you know, today reaches over a quarter billion listeners around the world every month. Um, and in that we saw distribution. We yeah. saw the opportunity to take Gimlet and reach a global audience. We thought that together we could solve what is one of the fundamental problems for the medium and also for the business, which is discovery. So if you ask, um, if you ask people uh, what podcast they listen to and how they found out, they're still basically finding out because their friend told them, right. they may have read it in media, but the kind of discovery that Spotify has unlocked to tell you about the right song, the right album, the right playlist, we thought that could work for podcast too, and in doing so, get to many, many more people. Does it continue to be an advertising model that gets it to profitability? Today, podcasts are mainly an, an, uh, uh, an advertising business. Does it continue to be that way? Um, I, think the gonna be, I think yeah. there's going to be other, all, all kinds of other forms yeah. of monetization, and Spotify is primarily a subscription business. Right. The vast majority of Spotify's revenue comes in the form of paying subscribers. And um, we think we're going to unlock new monetization models for, for podcasts that will realize the true value of the media. Coming up, more from the Bloomberg 50 list. Joey Levin, he was a junior banker who ended up succeeding Barry Diller at IAC. This is Bloomberg Business Week. to a special edition of Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Jason Kelly in New York. We're celebrating the Bloomberg 50. It's our annual list of innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders who have changed the global business landscape in measurable ways over the past year. We'll hear more from this year's honorees, including Joey Levin. He took over IAC from Barry Diller in 2015, and he's grown the company to $10.5 billion. Plus, the banker who has big plans for Africa and 
the founder behind the almost $1 billion Southeast Asian fashion startup. But first, here's the Business Week editor, the architect behind the list. That's Brett Began. So to get on the list, it's not really a Lifetime Achievement Award. And there's many, many, many people that I want to put on this list every year, but they don't really have a data, any data or a metric to sort of prove um, why we should include them. So a lot of it is sort of looking at the numbers, looking at the figures and saying, OK, they did have a great year and we can actually show this through a stock price right. going up or an acquisition or a million other ways we try to measure it. Brett, I'm always curious about the kind of debates that you guys have as you're discussing all of these names, because I'm sure people like, his name has to be on this list. And you're like, no, it doesn't have to be on this list. There is a lot of that. There are a lot of people you look at and say, hey, this person, of course, is going to be on the list. And every year I think, oh, this person's definitely going to be on the list. And then we get to the end and they wind up not on it. Um, and that sort of happens because we decide either that the metric isn't strong enough, that it wasn't basically important enough. That's the other thing that happens. Yeah. A lot of people have metrics, but you sort of look at the how business shapes up and you say, actually, you know, if you think about it, this doesn't really merit inclusion. Is there a name uh, on the list that might surprise people that's not necessarily a household name like Kylie Jenner or Rihanna? Yeah, there are a lot of them, actually. And that's kind of what makes the list fun is that for every Kylie or, or Rihanna, there's actually a lot of people in here that you've probably never heard of. Um, you know, someone like Ritesh Agarwal, to me, is a really, really mm -hmm. interesting story. So so he's a 19 year old. He decides to travel around India as a budget traveler and says, this is terrible. You know, all these hotels have roaches and it's foam blocks for mattresses. What if I were to take hotels that are 150 rooms or smaller and sort of standardize? So have hot water in the showers, have actual uh, mattresses, right? Eliminate the bugs in the room. So I said, okay, I'll give this shot. He's 26 now. He's worth more than a billion dollars. His Oyo uh, hotel chain is adding 70 to 80 hotels a day, Amazing. Right? which is absolutely insane. And they are by room now the number two uh, hotel in the world and are poised to overtake Marriott pretty much early next year. So that story I found amazing. The most amazing little tidbit in there is that the way they use data and analytics yeah. to try to figure out what works. And they found found that if they put portraits of Marilyn Monroe <laughs> in the rooms, that people consider those hotels now boutique. And that actually increases, increases revenue per available room 10 to 11 percent per hotel. Wow. <laughs> you know, one, I love that. it's not always just single people. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk a little bit because it's one of our favorite storylines of the year. U.S. Women's National yes. Team. Yeah. Yes. Uh, a shoe in to some extent on the list, in yeah. part because this was much more than just winning the World Cup. So their, their metric actually is that the number of people that watched set records for any soccer game, not just, you know, for, for women playing, uh, for men, for women. Um, but they're also on the list because of their pay equity battle. Yeah. And, um, you know, they have uh, they're now basically this is going to come to trial next year. And they are they're one of the groups on there that is fighting very hard for pay equity. And their argument is a pretty you know good one, which is that um, they actually play in more, more games. They've won four four World Cups, um, don't we deserve a little bit more here? And we've, we're seeing actually elsewhere in the world that this is happening. Uh, Australia actually just granted their women's team the same amount of money as their men's team. I also always wonder on this list when you guys think about something that Business Week covers so well, and that is big business corporate stories or business trends. Who among the business community was worth being on this list this year? Huh, that's a great question. Um, you know, somebody that I uh, love is Ethan Brown. Yeah. Right. If you look at yeah. business this year, really hard to overlook the world of fake meat. Right. Um, <laughs> Beyond Meat is his company. Uh, you've got, you know, Impossible. And now you've got pretty much every other company doing this well. But their stock price up about 200 percent. Um, since it launched this year. It was a successful huge, IPO. Huge, huge, oh, right. huge IPO. Um, and it's just a space that is going to be worth so, like hundreds of billions of dollars in the coming years. So he was kind of a shoe in for that. Um, that's just also an area that we've covered, you know, at, at length. Kevin Mayer um, over at Disney with the launch of Disney Plus, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. signing up nearly 10 million people you know, almost right away. And one of the themes throughout this list is you see we have Kevin Mayer on the list. Um, Feige, Kevin Feige as well, yeah. who's, you know, at, over at Marvel with Avengers Endgame. And obviously they work to get, yeah. <laughs> together. A couple of Kevins just changing the world over at Disney. Exactly. And then you have people, you know, like Ann Sarnoff at Warner Brothers, yeah. right, who's charged with basically making HBO Max work. So you, you're seeing a ton in the streaming world this year. A lot of people on the list basically really responsible for reshaping how we watch TV. 
And now to another name on the Bloomberg 50 list, Joey Levin, one of the most influential executives in the fast changing world of digital media. He took over for Barry Diller as the CEO of IAC, the billionaire media mogul, handing over the reins back in 2015. And now Levin has grown the combined market value of IAC and Match Group, which it's spinning off, to $10.5 billion. I spoke with Levin at IAC's headquarters in New York about that spinoff and his strategy going forward. The reason that we do that is it, there, there's lots of micro reasons and sometimes there's tactical reasons, but the, the main reason that we do it is we like the process of building. We like the process of starting over. And when you have something huge, it overshadows everything else. And Match is such a good business, it's doing so well right now, and, and, and it, it, investors care tremendously about it. And anything else we do is basically irrelevant relative to how many subscribers Tinder had in a quarter. And when you get to that level, at some point you say, okay, this thing has the ability to be off on its own, and if we, if we put that thing on its own, then we can focus again on the smaller things because uh, when we're focused on the smaller things, you, you put that kind of energy in it, there's nowhere to hide, and you, you, gotta, uh, you gotta make those work, and, right. and we like that process. So match underway, is the idea you'll do something similar with Angie Home Services? I'd hope to at some point. Yeah. Uh, we, we've said right now we're not focused on that. Uh, we're focused on trying to get match done. Um, but at some point, that, that that very well may make sense, but you know, there's all kinds of considerations and and where and when and timing and how and all those things are are kind of wide open. Right. And so when you look through the rest of the portfolio, where are you spending a lot of your time, either building or uh, you know expanding? What are you What are you most excited about? I know that's like having you pick among your children, but no. you know. Uh, so first of all, I'll, I'll maybe do it in terms of size. Angie is a huge one and is a, I think, a fantastic business in a fantastic category with an incredible lead that we can do really cool things on product. And uh, uh, we're, we're doing kind of the most ag aggressive product evolution in Angie's history right now and we're very optimistic about what we can do with that, and so that's pretty exciting. I'm, I'm spending a decent amount of time on that. Uh, I, next is uh, in, I guess we could do it in order of uh, to profit, but Dot Dash. Dot yeah. Dash is, I think, the modern publisher, uh, digital publisher. The All these other businesses have been in the publishing category. There, there's been a tremendous rise and fall of publishing business, and Dot Dash has just stayed very focused on delivering people content, what they call need-to-know content. You can call it sort of pull content as against push content. Push content is what you and I are doing right now is we're presuming that people want to hear from one of us and we're doing an interview and we're shipping it out. They, they do. Can. I guarantee <laughs> you they do. Yes. <laughs> uh, what, what Dot Dash is, is doing is saying, uh, we know people are looking for this thing specifically, which is what are the best hiking boots or uh, uh, what do I do about lower back pain or things like that. And we're making sure that we create the best content to answer those questions. The, what we say, freshest, fastest, fewest. Freshest meaning to the extent there's anything updated in the category, we're always constantly updating that. Fastest meaning we actually deliver our, our uh, site faster than anybody else. And fewest meaning having the fewest ads so that right. there's no room for anybody else or no reason for anybody else to come in. We want a great consumer experience. We don't want to over monetize it. And, and nobody else is doing that in that area and we're finding that we can do it very well and we're, we're going to uh, outspend everybody in having the best content in there. It's, it's a, I, I ambitiously make a Netflix analogy in that what Netflix is doing on, on uh, video content we're trying to do on sort of print or, or this need to know content. Yeah. Uh, outspend have the, by far the best content in the category and uh, it's turning out to be a real business with a real moat. The nicely profitable and I think great growth potential. More from the Bloomberg 50 list coming up, including Southeast Asia's tech sensation that's upending the world of fashion and retail, plus the banker who has big plans for Africa. This is Bloomberg Business Week.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Jason Kelly. Join us every day on the radio starting at 2 p.m. Wall Street time. You can also catch up on our daily show by listening to our podcast. Get that at Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Bloomberg.com, wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also find us online at businessweek.com and through our mobile app. Next on our Bloomberg 50 list is what our editors called Southeast Asia's tech sensation. It's an almost billion dollar valuation for her B2B fashion startup called Zalingo. That makes Ankiti Bose one of the few women in the industry to run a company of that size. Here's our conversation from the B50 red carpet in New York City. So, uh, you know, everybody wears clothes. And uh, <laughs> um, the apparel industry, uh, the apparel and textile industry is almost 5% of global GDP. So it's huge. Yeah. Uh, but despite that, very little digitization, very little technology has really touched the entire industry. Which is remarkable. Which is, which is remarkable, exactly. So unlike pharmaceuticals, industrials, uh, the way your iPhone is made, unlike any of that, uh, there is very little traceability, um, sustainability, technology, or really any amount of transparency in the supply chain in apparel. And that leads to all these problems that you hear of and that fashion is accused of, which are all true, by the way, that we're filling up the landfills. There right. may be little children working in factories in Vietnam or in Indonesia or in Bangladesh making clothes for you uh, that you're buying here. Um, or that uh, the clothes are not sustainable, people are buying too much. All of that is true. And all of that can be solved with technology by creating a lot of transparency across the supply chain. So that's where we come in. We, we provide a technology platform for mills, factories, uh, literally as upstream as the farmers to interact with the brands mm -hmm. that want products made by these people and make sure that it's done in a sustainable, transparent love way. Love that part of it. Well, and I love the transparency piece of this. We have spent so much time, I mean, if we think about our big themes yeah. of 2019, <laughs> uh, you know, Fashionopolis, Dana Thomas's great book right. about fast fashion and everything yes. bad, candidly, that yes. that's done and all the sort of bad will that it's engendered in a whole uh, category of the population. I have to think that lack of transparency, though, existed for a reason. People yes. didn't want, uh, you know, how hard was it to sort of crack into this? So you're exactly right. Today, the fashion supply chain has about 20 players, uh, and you only need five of them, which means that about 14 or 15 of those guys or girls are just there because they're they are all agents. <laughs> Most of them are guys. Yeah, exactly. They're agents, they're traders, they're not adding a lot of value in the value chain. So they're really either hoarding inventory That's or they're amazing. money lenders. So I, I, sorry, I just want to go back actually. to that. So it's like there, there are 20 and there need yeah. to be five. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Exactly. Yeah. So about 15 of them don't like us a lot, but the five that are adding value, we're adding an immense amount of value to their business yeah. and just economics and then making sure that they are uh, held accountable if they're not following the right practices. But to Jason's point, like how tough was it like making your inroads and so on and so forth? Because I feel like it's such an established yeah. supply chain or supply you know, that was out there. How tough was it to do this? Actually, once you go beyond the big manufacturers and you really go into the world of Asian manufacturing, manufacturing or uh, South American manufacturing or even right here in the US, it's quite fragmented. Huh. So, uh, you know, most of fast fashion is made within a very fragmented manufacturer base. And then once you start giving them technology and bringing them online, it becomes much more easy for them to find their suppliers and their buyers and, you know, transact without agents in the middle. Right. So uh, it's it's maybe it's hard in the beginning to get a critical mass in a new uh, country or in, in a new area or in a new, in you know, subcategory like denims or, or something. But once you do it, there is so much of a network effect uh, that it spreads quite fast because businesses see the value very quickly. And that brings us to our next honoree from the Bloomberg 50 list. He's bringing banking services to 16 million customers across Africa. Here's James Mwangi. He's the CEO of Kenya's largest lender. It's called Equity Group Holdings. People graduate up. They may start okay. very micro, they become small, they become medium, they become a large enterprise. The same with individuals. They start uh, occasionally as peace and farmers, they become agro businesses, and the individual's well-being continues to grow. But the biggest growing segment uh, is the medium enterprises. Okay. That's where you find the scale, size, is becoming really uh, significant. And it's because they populate the value chains of the corporates that operate in the continent. And uh, consequently, they now become uh, the face of African, uh, Africans in entrepreneurship. 
I have to say, James, what I love about this, and I remember talking to Bahamut Yunus about microloans and what you could do with a small amount of money, the impact you could have on a family. And I think about what you're doing, multiply it many times over, that allows people to have a financial identity, create a means for themselves and their family, and then even kind of work up the value chain. It's pretty remarkable, and it impacts the country that they're in as well. That's true, because the African, um, entrepreneurship uh, or capitalism in Africa is at the individual level, yeah. the entrepreneur level. Right. And that individual supports uh, the immediate family and sometimes the extended family. So when they start the small enterprise, they provide the jobs for the entire family. They take uh, care of the education of the entire family. And essentially, it, they become a catalyst. So small loans have very significant impact because of uh, the individual capitalism. Uh, Africa is not corporatized, right. so we don't have huge corporate. It's the small businesses that, uh, that aggregate to the African economies. So speaking of the African economies, <coughs> excuse me, let's talk about Kenya because an ambitious plan underway, mm -hmm. you're an architect of it. Kenya, uh, Kenya's Vision 2030, uh, I believe it's called Vision 2030, uh, tell us what's underneath that because the ambition is huge. Uh, Vision 2030 is a long-term strategic plan uh, to, to see Kenya transformed from a least developed uh, country to a middle-income economy. I've been the chairman of uh, Vision 2030 now for the last uh, 13 years. Right. And we have seen the economy move from a 10 billion US dollar uh, size economy to a hundred billion dollars, growing 10 times uh, within a period of 13 years. In the process, we have created numerous jobs, thousands of jobs for young people, because the country is very young with a mean age of 18 years. So the need for jobs is enormous. But more importantly, we have seen the law the private sector mm. uh, have played. And that is where equity have played a very significant role uh, in providing credit uh, financial or support, but more importantly, the foundation provides ca uh, capacity building. Next up, ones to watch, including a prime contender to wind up on a future Bloomberg 50. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Welcome back to Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Jason Kelly. You can also listen to us on the radio on Sirius XM Channel 119, also AM 1130 in New York, 1061 in Boston, 991 FM in Washington, D.C., AM 960 in the Bay Area, in London on DAB Digital, and through the Bloomberg Business app. Well, we turn now from 2019 to the people Bloomberg Business Week has named to watch in 2020. One of them is Seema Hingarani. She's the founder and chair of the nonprofit Girls Who Invest. It's dedicated to increasing the number of women in portfolio management and leadership in the asset management industry. In four years, we have put through 350 college women through our 10-week on-campus summer program, where that's four weeks of training in the classroom and then a six-week paid internship at one of the leading asset management firms in the world. It's been incredible, and 80% of those women are staying in the investment business. They're staying, are they moving up the ladder? They are. That's it's great. fantastic. Well, and Seema, one of the things that I, I love talking to you about is the fact you were on the other side of the table. You were, you were distributing money in some ways. You were picking a manager, so you saw that from the other side of the table. Why has it taken so long for the rest of the world to sort of get on board with this? You know, I, I, I think it's just coming up and, and saying, you know, maybe we ought to rethink this. Yeah. We've been having trouble recruiting women in particular into our business, uh, and yet, we do the same thing over and over again. So when I talk to a lot of the large investment firms around the world, I would ask them, so what do you do when you recruit? And they would say to me, oh, we go to these four colleges, right. and we go to these investment banking programs. And I thought, well, you guys, no wonder how we're having a problem with diversity. Right. Let's go bigger, broader, and so fine, I'll do the work. I'll go find women across the entire country, from colleges all across the US, with different majors of study, different ethnic backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, and I'll run a program through the summer and we'll train them up so that when we send them to you for these internships, they hit the ground running. 
Seema, I do wonder though if there's something different because I feel like there's been a lot of talk for years about getting more women into kind of the financial industry. Is there something that's changed in the last couple of years? Is it finally understanding that the studies and the importance of diversification, that it makes a difference in terms of financial difference that all of a sudden everybody's awakened? Yes, I think that's right. I think um, while the research has been out there, there's more research that shows and proves that more gender diverse teams get better outcomes. There's actually research now that shows that more mixed gender investment teams get better investment results, which goes to the heart of Girls Who Invest and what we're trying to do. And I think honestly in this country now with movements such as Time's Up and Hashtag Me Too, it's certainly raised uh, you know, more attention on this issue and more firms are paying attention. And I think the final push has really come from the big institutional investors. Yeah. So you now have big public pension plans in mm -hmm. particular saying to these investment managers, you know, if you don't have more diversity on your investment team, I've read the research too and I believe the research. I don't believe you will get long-term consistent investment returns. So I might pull my money from you and put it across the street. Huge. I'm so glad you brought that up because mm -hmm. it feels like that's what has to happen. And again, going back to uh, your time in New York City, like the money has to speak here. Like the that nothing's going to change. I mean, we talk about this with ESG as well. You know, until startups. the source of the uh -huh. money essentially says no or change, nothing's going to happen. So you think that that is starting to happen? Yes, and, and it, certainly it's a combination. I mean, there are amazing leaders in our industry who do get it and I've been trying to push. Yeah. To get it as broad based as we need it to get, yes, we're going to have to have the big investors out there saying, this isn't going to work. And standing up and actually pulling their capital and putting it yeah. elsewhere. So much of what you're doing is creating that pipeline and I do think that's so important. But you, you, we got to make sure that there's the support along the way and that really speaks to a company's culture and making sure that there's those folks to do that. So how do we get to that? Yes, <laughs> Is exactly. it just by getting more and more women into the industry or what? Well, so that's part of it. Um, you know, back when I was at the city of New York and I was the CIO and I had these conversations with the leaders of the business Business. Yeah. Um, and I'd look down at their organizational charts and say, you guys, where are all the women on your investment right. team, right? Um, and so what they would say to me is, well, we don't get resumes from women, so clearly a pipeline issue, which I agreed, maybe we do have that and let's fix that. But I did say to them then, you know, I'd like to have the other part of the conversation, no judging, no blaming, but there's still firms out there in our business that have cultures that are not so welcoming to yep. women, so let's have that conversation too and tackle it from both ends, make a lot more progress a lot faster. So what I'm really encouraged by now is we are sitting down with the leadership of the industry and, and talking about their cultures. That's great. And why is it that once these women come in, they don't stay? And how do we help get these women to a position where they're getting promoted for these new opportunities, new growth opportunities, that right now they're not really getting put in those positions? And that wraps up this special edition of Bloomberg Business Week focused on the Bloomberg 50. Check out the latest edition of Bloomberg Business Week. It's available on newsstands now. It's also online at businessweek.com and through our mobile app. And check out our daily Business Week podcast as well. And big news, we're coming to YouTube starting Monday, January 6th. Check it out. Just visit youtube.com and search Bloomberg Global News. More Bloomberg Television starts right now.